The book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, has a very interesting verse in it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And of course, I've talked about that in other studies. It goes on to, to say that this falling away that happens, that will come. But as far as the son of man, or the, uh, excuse me, the um, man of sin, son of perdition, as far as him being revealed, there's something that's withholding him from being revealed, and that is the body of Christ. The body of Christ has to leave before the Antichrist can show up. So there are two signs there that happen before the day of Christ. You know, there it talks about in verse 2, the day of Christ, you know, being at hand. Two things that have to happen. There has to be a falling away, and there has to be a uh, the, the man of sin being revealed. And he can't be revealed until the body of Christ leaves talked about that in many studies. And I proved that thing over and over again. If you're getting upset and going to write about the uh, preacher of Rapture's lie created by Jesuits and John Nelson Darby and all the other stuff, you're just, you're off, okay? You're off the, out of the comments. I don't have time for your stupidity anymore. It just, it's ridiculous. I've disproved that thing so many times now. If you're really looking for the truth, you can find it. But um, I need to correct an error that I've been making. And... Um, and it's something that I knew about for a very, very long time. And it just, it's become a force of habit with me. And that is, I say apostate. I use apostate for lost people. Um, apostasy is a, the word here in this text that you, if you want to get into the Greek thing, and I don't, but because you don't really need Greek to prove this, but the thing of a falling away is the Greek word apostasia or something like this. It means apostasy. Apostasy is to fall away from a standing position, is what that means. So I've been saying lost people are apostates. You know, it's something I've been repeating and just been parroting it because I've heard it from other people and things, so I just repeat it. The fact of the matter is you can't be a lost apostate. All right? Apostates are people that are saved and have fallen away from where they used to stand. Right, that's what's going away, or that's what's going on there. Saved people that have fallen away from the stands that Christians took for thousands of years. Okay, uh, well, I shouldn't say thousands, over a thousand years. You know, uh, in terms of, you know, if you go back to when Jesus died on the cross, you know, we're looking at um, not even two thousand years yet since that happened. But my point is. This falling away is what we are seeing right now. And again, another error that I've made in my past is I've, I usually would say, well, it goes back to the 1960s with the introduce, introduction of a lot of the new versions and the rock music and the, all the hippie movement. And all that. It goes back a lot farther than that. And there again, I will admit to another fault, and that is I have covered up for a few people, and I'm not going to be doing that anymore. Um, I'm going to be telling the truth today. And some of it's going to probably shake some people up a little bit, but the truth has a tendency of doing that. All right. And I uh, just want to give you another verse here to go to Revelation chapter 3. And I've talked about this plenty of times as well. Revelation chapter 3. Come on here. Revelation 3. Uh, verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Interesting that this wicked church here, this and it was a church meaning a group of people, not some building somewhere. This wicked church, they're... Problem was they were worldly. 
They were lukewarm. And what are they told? They're told to repent and be zealous. Hmm. Interesting. Because those th two things are looked down upon by the apostates of today. They don't like the word repent. They try to change the meaning of that word, repentance. But look at uh, verse 20 through 22 here in Revelation chapter 3. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. So he's not dealing here. And, and you know, again, let me say this. If you're new to this thing, um, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Now, these were seven literal churches. I understand that. But there's also some instruction in righteousness here, as in seven different periods within church history, also seven different types of Christian. All right. So this last church here is very similar to what's going on with the great falling away. They're neither cold nor hot. They're lukewarm. They're increased with riches. They're, they're very wealthy, you know, there. But uh, verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I've got to be very honest with you. I don't think that there's going to be many people that make it to the rapture. He said, what, you think people are going to lose their salvation? I didn't say that. I said they're not going to make it. They're not going to stay faithful. They are not going to overcome. Because as things get worse and worse and worse and the falling away, you know, it's interesting when something falls away, you know, when I've, I've felled quite a few trees in my day in logging and things, and it's very interesting because as that tree is just starting to move, it's barely even moving. You know, when you're felling a tree and you, you put in the back cut and you're knocking in the wedges or whatever into the back cut, you'll see that back cut just starting to open up just a little bit. And you look at the top of the tree and you can see the top of the tree starting to move. You say, okay, pull the saw out of the cut and move away from the, the stump of the tree at about a 45 degree angle. Get out of there. Make sure you don't trip, <laughs> you know. And as that tree starts to come down, it starts to speed up and speed up. And by the time it's there, it's boom, down it goes. And as it's falling away, you can't make it come back up to the stump again. And as the church is falling away, and as it's getting farther and farther and farther, down it goes. It's going to crash. And I'm seeing a lot of the brethren that used to stand for the truth and used to stand for the right things, they're falling away. And ironically, a lot of them are coming out and attacking me. And saying, oh, I sure hate to see Brian change, and I sure hate to see him, you know, changing and coming out with this stuff. I haven't changed, changed since 2008. The gospel that I've been preaching is the same thing going back to the beginning of my ministry. I've always preached the new birth. I've always preached repentance to God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same event. Coming to God as a broken sinner and saying, I believe by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross to pay for my sins. And after that, your life changes because you are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And there has to be a change afterwards. Not that you do. You know, people are putting this thing on me. Oh, it's all works and stuff. No, it's God owning you and He through the power of the Holy Spirit, convicts you of sin, and now you change. And if you don't change, then you are chastened of the Lord. And if the change isn't there, and the chastisement isn't there, then the Bible calls you a bastard in the book of Hebrews. In other words, a bastard is somebody that does not know their father. It's what the Bible teaches. But you see this thing here in Revelation chapter 3 about this final time here in the falling away. Now, when did the falling away begin? Like I said, many people foolishly try to say it's the 20th century. I don't believe that. And I'm, I, I can't go into a real detailed study here. I just, I need to get this thing out because it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I thought, you know what? Somebody else wants to do this study, put the time into this thing, or maybe down the road I can do more into this and show you more proof. But th the apostasy is getting so bad, the falling away is getting so bad right now, I can't afford to put weeks and weeks and weeks into one study. I just have to start getting on camera and getting this stuff out quicker. 
I believe it began with the revivals of the 1700s. A lot of the early Methodist revivals, they were doing things and people were getting into the jerks and stuff. Their bodies were jerking and they were saying, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. Chapter and verse. Where do you see that thing in the Bible? And, you know, there, was, there were lost people that were getting the jerks. So you have saved people being having the Holy Spirit come upon them and they were jerking and twitching and stuff like this. And you have lost people doing it too. So much so that there was a drunk there the one time and he didn't he refused to get saved and everything. And the guy actually was jerking so hard it snapped his neck and he died. But this was a movement of the Holy Spirit. The revivals brought in carnival preaching. That's the second thing. I call this the ten steps of the falling away. So you have revivalism leading to carnival preaching. You had the guys out there and they're putting on the performance and they're yelling and they're shouting and they're, brethren, you need to come to God today. It's the day of salvation. See, that atmosphere, the excitement, the electricity, the yelling, the screaming, the loud voice and the and the fiery sermons and the you know everything else, the acting up there. See? Carnival preaching came in. It was a carnival atmosphere. Number three, you ready? You have the Masons, as in the Masonic Lodge, Freemasonry, Satanism. And Freemasonry made its way into carnival preaching. You say, Brian, come on now, Brian. What are you talking about? Well, I have three sources right here. Three books. I'm going to show you here with the overhead camera. Billy Sunday and the Redemption of Urban America. This guy was a showman. Was he saved? I have no idea. I really have no idea. Um, to be honest with you, after seeing some of the quotes and things about the guy, and I'm going to show you a quote here. Uh, that's pretty bad. Okay. Let me show you this one here. Um, it says here, plenty of non-Protestant religious leaders criticized Sunday as well. Some Roman Catholic churches were largely Irish or German congregations uh, interpreted his attacks on saloon keeping and drinking as insults directed at their ethnic backgrounds. And attacks also came from conservative church quarters, especially independent fundamentalists and Baptists, who condemned the evangelist for associating with members of secret societies such as the Masons and Woods, Woods, Woodmen of the World, and who could not understand why he frequently reached out to Roman Catholics and put in a good word for them. Billy Sunday? Yeah. How about this quote? Sunday also sat in the drawing rooms of the economic and social elite. John D. Rockefeller Jr. became a special friend. John D. Rockefeller Jr.? By the way, that's uh, page 94. The other quote is on page 81. 80 and 81 there. Billy Sunday was a Mason. You say, well, you know, was he really, really into it? And was, you know, things like that. I don't know. Was he just an honorary Mason? And he was just so career driven that uh, he joined with the Masons and was joining with all these other bad people? I have no idea. I really don't know. But he's promotional of Roman Catholicism. And he's linking up with all these high level Illuminati elitists, these rich, powerful elite families, and they're promoting him and giving him money? I wonder why that would be. We'll see why here in a couple minutes. How about the life and sayings of Sam P. Jones by his wife? We'll go back here to the section here. The funeral service. Page uh, 347 it says here, 
Delegations from secret orders to which Mr. Jones belonged composed the honorary escort and led the procession. The Rome Commandery of Knights Templar and local lodges of Masons and Knights of Pythias were well represented. Huh? You say, Brian, I... Come on. Sam Jones, this famous evangelist guy, this great man of God and everything else, he was a Mason. I mean, okay, yeah, his wife wrote about it in this book here, but, you know, do you have any other proof? How about this picture? Page uh, 116. Sam P. Jones at 38 years old. So he's my age, exactly in this picture here. Why is he doing the Masonic uh, hidden hand of masonry where they put their hand inside their coat? And, you know, I had some brethren the one time, I don't remember who it was, it's been a long time ago, but they, I had these, you know, this brethren, some brethren, and they, they sent me a picture of Charles Spurgeon, and he was doing the same thing. And it was from one of his books. And they're like, isn't this a Masonic hand signal? What's, what's going on here? And, you know, all the old timers were not Masons, okay? I'm not saying any evangelist that was part of the revival movement and stuff like this, I'm not saying they were all members of the Masonic Lodge, no. D.L. Moody spoke out against the Masonic Lodge. Um, Charles G. Finney, I have a book here somewhere. Uh, yeah, right here. Um, I'll show you here on the screen. The Character, Claims, and Practical Workings of Freemasonry by Charles G. Finney. Uh, and it basically goes into the fact that Charles Finney used to be a Mason, and now he's denouncing the Masonic Lodge. And this was written in 1869. So, they weren't all Masons. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that all the old, well-known preachers were all members of the Masonic Lodge, and it's a grand conspiracy or something. I'm not trying to say that. But what I'm saying is, some of these men, and I've defended some of them, and it's it's a bad thing. You know, I apologize for that. I, I some of these guys. Here we have uh, J. Frank Norris, the pastor of the two biggest uh, Baptist Babel buildings at the time, back in the early 1900s. So you have J. Frank Norris. Look at this picture here from when he graduated from his uh, seminary. Again, you see the Masonic hand signal. And, you know, J. Frank Norris is hanging out with the president and all kinds of other stuff. A lot of these guys are friendly with government officials and Billy Sunday is going and promoting government things and whatever else. He was the one that uh, came out with, uh, what was it, the 14th Amendment or something? I can't remember the number, but the prohibition thing, you know, making alcohol illegal, and which created the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the BATF, and now it's BATF-E because they added explosives to it, but created a government bureaucracy. And basically what they did is they made all the small liquor manufacturers, they put them all out of business, because of prohibition. And then when they reinstituted that, okay, you can make alcohol again, now it was only a few select members of the Illuminati. The Bushes, Miller, you know, some of these others. Hmm. So basically they used prohibition. They used Billy Sunday to pass a law that enabled them to centralize their power. The alcohol manufacturers. Really something. A lot of these guys were Masons. And, it, and if I've defended them and things like that, I do apologize for that. You know, I, I honestly have not known really what to do about all this stuff over the years. I mean, you just kind of look at it and you go, well, maybe they were, you know, because their preaching doesn't line up with being a Mason. You know, that's weird stuff. Maybe they were just honorary Masons. Maybe they really didn't know what they were part of. Maybe they, they just... We're doing it just to, to get the gospel preached more, or I don't know. 
But, you know, I saw a quote recently where Sam Jones was actually even reading from the Quran in one of his meetings. Why? Because Masons will read from the Quran, the Shriners. And the Quran goes back to Islam. Islam goes back to Roman Catholicism. You can look up uh, Dr. Walter Veith. Uh, he's got a very good video on the thing, the connections between the Roman Catholic whore and their little daughter, the Muslims. The Muslims, as my wife likes to say. But uh, what did this lead to? Well, what did the Masons do in the past? What were they known for? What was, what was Masonry early on before they started to bring in the esoteric knowledge and the occultism and things into the Masons? The Masons were a guild. And you know what Masons do? They build buildings, stone temples. Hmm. And they actually build these stone temples after ancient pagan structures. Are there any buildings in America that are built after ancient pagan structures? Capitol buildings and um, church buildings? Where they take the obelisk from masonry and they put it on top of a Greek Parthenon? Like I talked about in my study on the independent fundamental Baptist Catholicism. They take Masonic symbols and put it on top of a Greek Parthenon, and they call it a church. Hmm. Could it be that the growing power among the Masons, and by the way, there was an anti-Masonic party, political party, in the 1800s, before the Civil War. After the Civil War, the Masons started to regain their power. Interesting. So what do you have? The revivalism led to carnival preaching, which led to Masons becoming carnival preachers, and they, in turn, started to build these huge, massive church buildings. The giant Babel building movement came in as a result of these men back in the 1800s and early 1900s because they built the cult of personality. That would be known in the future, right there. The two biggest Baptist Babel buildings we're under this man right here, J. Frank Norris, Dr. J. Frank Norris. And these guys had a charisma. They had a certain power to them, you know. They brought in those Babel buildings. And for the first time, I mean, the very first Baptist Babel building in America was built in 1700. And you aren't going to find Baptist Babel buildings before then. They don't exist. See, Christians for years and years and for centuries were meeting in homes, in caves, in fields, wherever. They didn't have Babel buildings. You can't go out and find them. There aren't any out there. And so what you have is now this movement is starting to bring in not just Babel buildings, but huge mega Babel buildings. Why? you got to fit people in there. I mean, J. Frank Nars, 20,000 members in his Babel building. That's getting up into the size of the Joel Osteen and Rick Warren and some of these other guys. The huge mega, you know, churches of today are the size of what J. Frank Norris had there. So what did this huge Babel building and the cult of personality, what did it lead to? Well, an extreme push to win souls at any cost. So now you had the whole movement of going door to door inviting people out to come to church, you know. This led to the bus ministry movement, and which led further and further and further into, into a lot of other things, things that have no basis in Scripture, you know. And these, you know, Babel buildings are doing whatever they can to get people brought in, to swell the numbers so they can pay for these huge big Babel buildings. And it's interesting because when J. Frank Norris died, his Babel buildings fell into ruin. I think the one in Texas, I think it's still going, but it's like charismatic or something now, you know. But the one in Detroit is an abandoned building. Oh, what's the Bible say? If this work or this council be of men, it will uh, come to naught. Mm -hmm. So what did this extreme push for soul winning, what did it lead to? Compromising the gospel. 
You see, when you're meeting out in the woods or when you're persecuted believers, you're not really going to get too many people wanting to join you. Let me show you. Turn to Acts chapter uh, 5 here. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. We're not going to read all that, but it's but verses 1 through 11. Um, it talks about this thing of Ananias and Sapphira and how that they came in, they lied about you know, some land that they had and things, and they God dropped them dead right there. But now look at the lost world's reaction. Look at this. Verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church, say people, and upon as many as heard these things, lost people. Great fear came on them. Verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. Huh? You mean lost people didn't want to join them? Because they could see, they had great fear. They were saying, wow, these people, they magnified them, but they said, I don't want to join them. Why? Look what it's going to cost me. Look what happens if you lie. You get dropped dead. God actually himself drops you dead. And back then, the early Christians were being persecuted, killed for their faith. Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, was one of the ones that was actually going out hunting them down, killing them. So you see, back then, if you go back to the first century and say, you know what? Salvation is just being part of a local church and believing. You say, is, it gonna, is there going to be a changed life? No, 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 no. That's, that's work salvation. The people back then would have been like, you're crazy. That's a false gospel. Salvation has always meant a change in your life. Why? Because the world hates Christians. Because God gets a hold of your life and He says, I want you to start living this certain way. And you say, well, God, that's going to get me in trouble with people. That's the whole point. True biblical salvation is contrary to the world. It goes completely opposite of the way that the world is going. But you see, because of the prosperity that has happened in America, because of all the nice things here in this Babel building movement and everything else, because of that, now you can be a Christian and be a friend of the world. Everything is just wonderful and happy and good. You don't have to suffer for Jesus Christ. So you can pretend that salvation comes to those people who have no change in their life. Oh, they're still saved because they've believed. They believe they have a profession of faith, so they must be saved. And for those of you out there that teach that there has to be a changed life, well, you're just a heretic. We're going to see what that's leading to. So you have the gospel is compromised. Why? Because you have to bring them in. Bring them into the Babel building. Bring them in. we got to fill the ranks. we got bills to pay. We can bust out this wall right here and we can, we can build on a new wing. And we'll name it after the people that donate the most money. And we can, we can put, bring in carpet and wall-to-wall -wall carpets and we can have big, huge cathedral ceilings and we can have light-up crosses and we can have huge choirs and with robes that match. But hey, that all takes money, doesn't it? And how do you get that money? By getting out into the community and getting those people in. And what else can we do? Let's make programs for the children so we can get them in and then get their parents in and we'll get money and then we'll, get, we'll build a school for the children. So we'll have a private Christian school. Instead of encouraging and telling the parents you need to educate the children yourself, we'll bring them into our Christian school that we have here at our Babel building. I used to go to one of those places don't tell me that, oh, that's ridiculous, Brian. It's not done that way. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I used to go to this huge big place and Jerry Falwell spoke there. I've talked about this before. Liberty Baptist Church in um, Lincoln, Ephrata, actually. It's right outside of Ephrata in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And I went to that place. They had a whole wall of that giant big Babel building. Back in its heyday, there were 900 members. They had this whole I shouldn't say 900 members. They had 900 people at one of the services when Jack Hiles 
when he was there, but they had a whole wall that was built as a temporary wall that they could knock it out when they need to and expand the Babel building. And that wall now today, the siding's coming off of it on the outside and their squirrels get in and they run around in the sanctuary and it's really a wonderful time. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and the building's falling apart. It went from hundreds of people going there and regular attendance in a Christian school and everything else to now it's just a handful of people, 20, 30 people in regular attendance. What's going on? If this work of this council be of men, it will come to naught. But how many of those big Babel buildings have kept the numbers up because they still have the cult of personality guy there? Or because they compromise and they go and they become worldly? So what do you have? You have the Gospels compromised and then you change the meaning of the word church. So now the average person thinks, I'm a member of a good New Testament local church meaning a building. And yet a lot of people that go to these churches are not in the body of Christ. You will not find one reference in your King James Bible where the word church means anything but people. Church in your New Testament here, never in the Bible, church never means anything more than people. It never is a reference to the building. Not one time is it a reference to the building. Not once. But you see, you change the meaning. You compromise the gospel and then change the meaning and you tell people, you have to be part of a good New Testament local church. And if you're not, oh boy, see, you're a heretic if you don't go to church, even though that term, go to church, doesn't even appear in the Bible. How can I be a heretic for doing something that doesn't appear in the Bible? Now, what do you do next? You fill the Babel buildings with lost people. You just keep compromising the gospel and compromising and compromising and compromising until now, the average church, a lot of them don't even have saved people in them. I'd say probably 90-95% of them don't have one saved person even in attendance. And what's that about? Well, you go from that, filling the Babel buildings with lost people, to attacking true biblical salvation and the new birth. You call it work salvation. You call it lordship salvation. You confuse true lordship salvation, which is a continual works, staying in good works to prove that you're saved and to, and to make sure that you, know, you don't uh, somehow... You know, you have to continually merit your salvation and you have to work and then God grants you repentance later on and then you get saved. And it's, it's Calvinism. It's true lordship salvation. But you take that and you blur it and you say, people that say you have to have a changed life after salvation, after salvation, you say, well, see, that's lordship salvation. It's not lordship salvation. It is not lordship salvation. It's true biblical salvation. There must be be a change. And the change is brought about because God purchases you when you get saved and He owns you and He tells you what to do. And His Holy Spirit will make changes in your life. And if those changes are not present and if there's no chastening, you're not saved. It's just as simple as that. So, but these modern, wicked, lost Babel buildings attack true Bible believers. Let me show you this. Show you this verse here in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 1. I guess I'll just read the whole thing here. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And by the way, you say, well, what about all these Babel buildings that are filled with lost people? You know, where's the swift destruction? Well, think about the time of Jacob's trouble. Some of these Babel buildings have been built, and they've been in existence for 40, 50, 60 years, but they'll be destroyed in less than seven years. That's pretty swift destruction. But look at verse 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. 
Many? Yeah, that's right. The majority of people right now are following their pernicious ways. But look at this. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. True King James Bible believing ministries that teach repentance unto salvation and the new birth. That is the way of truth and it is evil spoken against. And I'm seeing people that used to stand for this now backing off and saying it's just belief. Just belief. There's no changed life. You know, you can you can live in sin and just be it's totally okay and you know, you're just a carnal Christian. Uh-huh. Sure. Right. Where's the chastening then if you're a carnal Christian? Where's the punishment? It's not there. Oh, but they're still saved. Sure they are. And you know the interesting thing about it is? This whole movement, the, this, the true gospel that it's just, just believe, just believe. And, and it's just as long as you believe in Jesus, you're saved. There doesn't have to be a change. It's just, just believe, only believe. What's the, what's the key philosophy behind that? Is it a more strict attitude towards sin or a lighter attitude towards sin? A lighter one. They're trying, and, and when you try to con confront these people, these easy believism heretics, they will actually say, they'll look through the Bible to try and find examples of people living in sin that were still saved. And this is a move of the Holy Spirit, huh? The Holy Spirit leads people to, to search through pages of, of the New Testament and try to find places where people were living in sin and yet still saved. Huh? So in other words, let's bring the standards down is what this system is trying to say. But what's the tenth step to bringing in this falling away? What's the final phase? Well, first you had revivalism. That led to carnival preaching. Then you had the Masonic Lodge coming in, infiltrating the carnival preachers. Why? Number four, to build the huge Babel buildings around these cults of personality. Number five, the fifth thing that that led to is an extreme push to win souls at any cost. Number six, that led to compromising the true gospel. Number seven, you change the meaning of the word church. Number eight, you fill the Babel buildings with lost people. You have no choice. You got a building that cost you a million dollars to build. You got a mortgage to pay off. You have huge electrical and heating cost and paving and grounds upkeep and you know, well, they don't do property tax because they're 501c3 incorporated under the federal government. So literally when you go onto one of these big Babel buildings that's 501c3, you are standing on government soil in a government building. And there are people that actually try to defend that. Number nine, you attack true biblical salvation and the new birth. And number 10, you prepare those lost people in those big Bible buildings. You prepare them for the rapture aftermath and the arrival of the Antichrist. That's it. That's what's going on. I mean, think about the time of Jacob's trouble. Which gospel is going to appeal to these Babel building lost people? Only believe. You can live however you want to live. You know, just live a, a, a life of total sin. There doesn't have to be any change. You can just get along with the world as long as you believe. Is that the gospel that's going to be preached? Oh, yeah. And what's the one that's going to be condemned? to those people that live in that time. This gospel that says, no, if you really want to be saved, it's going to mean a major change in your life, an extreme change in your life, so much so that you're going to be hunted down. And if they catch you, they're going to cut your head off. Who wants to join? Who, you know, come forward now. Come down to this old-fashioned altar and give your life to Christ. Uh-huh. Sure, yeah. 
You see, that's worked in America because you can go and you can play the little game and stuff like that. You can get caught up in the emotion as the, as the piano is softly playing, every head bowed, every eye closed. Preacher, would you pray for me? All that stuff. You can play that little game right now. And you can go on back and you can live a totally wicked life outside of the church, you know. You can do that and then go back to church. Oh, glory to God. Bless you, brother. Oh, I just praise you, Jesus. Oh, boy. I just, I just love the Word of God. And, uh, you know. and then they go home and they turn on sports. And they go home and they watch R-rated movies. Where's the chastening? Say, well, it's, you know, not really there, but, you know, it's okay because we believe. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, you know, I want to say this too. In terms of this thing of a changed life and people saying you should never, you know, you shouldn't preach to the lost that they sh they're going to have to have a changed life after salvation. Um, would you tell that to a Christian? Somebody gets saved in uh, Pakistan? Or some other uh, Muslim Catholic country? You say, uh, would you like to get saved? They say, what does that mean? Well, you're going to become a Christian. The person goes, you want me to be a Christian? I want to get my head cut off. My, my own family is going to try to kill me. Oh, no, 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 no. You just believe. There's nothing that changes afterward. There's no new birth. There's no new life in Christ. There's no change required. They look at you like you're crazy. You see, that's the problem with what this falling away system has created. Because it has created people that think themselves to be saved when they're not saved. And unfortunately, the falling away is truly saved people, because you can't fall away unless you are saved, truly saved people that once were preaching repentance to salvation, and then they start to hear some of these false prophets, and they go, I guess it is just belief. I guess we don't have to be servants of Jesus Christ after salvation. I guess I guess Brian Denlinger is a heretic because he teaches works salvation. And they fall away. And you know, it's interesting because that very thing right there is proof that you're the one falling away. If you've, if you've come against this ministry and said that I'm now teaching works salvation or something like that, you are the one that fell away. From the truth because you look at my ministry the entire time that I've ever been preaching since way back in 2008 that entire time I've always preached the same gospel so it isn't that I all of a sudden now I'm starting to teach another gospel or something I've always taught the same thing so if you at some point in time are like oh I, I, I'm so thankful for Brother Brian. I just love his ministry and everything else. And, and now you're like, I can't endorse his ministry anymore. You're the one that fell away, not me. Because I've been preaching the same thing all these years. Show me any time in my life, show me, a, refer to a video where I was preaching easy believism in the past. And now I preach works salvation. That's ridiculous. You're part of the falling away. So that's going to be it for this video. Just wanted to put this thing together quickly. Like I said, there's not, not a whole lot I'm putting into this just because I, I just got to get things out. And by the way, let me just say something else. Um, more and more people are, are taking my videos, and I made the decision early on that I would never copyright my videos. I would never try and force people to not you know, steal my stuff and things like that. I realized that people were going to cut my videos up and make me look bad and whatever else. Okay, and there, there are more and more people doing that. There are more and more people that are saying, I said such and such, you know, and whatever else. And, uh, you know, it irritates me when I see people that I thought were my friends that go and they listen to that. And uh, they're just like, they blindly just follow. Oh, wow, yeah, I didn't realize he was saying that. That's really bad. Brian's a heretic. Yeah, I don't like him anymore. Is that all the deeper you are? Oh. Uh, why don't you say something like, you know, uh, I, I'd like to actually hear the whole sermon and see the whole context of what Brian's trying to say. 
before this little clip is taken out or before this little quote is said about Brian? Why don't you watch the totality of the whole thing? Why don't you look at it? You say, well, I don't, I'm just not going to do that. Okay, goodbye. You know, if, if I mean, if, if you're going to be condemning me as a heretic and everything else, you know, don't waste time watching my channel anymore. Just unsubscribe. Go away. I'm not interested in people that are falling away. I'm interested in people that are going to stand, that are going to overcome, you know, that are going to get themselves firmly grounded in what the Bible's teaching. And then as soon as they hear any hint of people going against that, just say, oh, sorry, off. Shut the video off. Walk away from them. Overcome the falling away. Just because most of the brethren are falling away right now does not mean that you have to fall away. Fight it. So that's going to be it for this video. Please pray for us as we have a lot of uh, neat projects coming up here. Um, as I've been saying in some of the other videos, we're really trying hard to do a lot of work on the ministry headquarters here, a lot of things going. So we are trying to come out with videos and studies and things and uh, I'm going to keep working for the Lord until he says that's it or whatever. So that will be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Please keep us in your prayers.